Hey, welcome to the Note Investor Podcast. I'm Dan Deppin, and today joined by Chris Seventy. So, Chris, how's it going? Good, Dan. How are you? Good. Thanks for joining. It's been a little while since I talked to you. I think it was like Note Expo. Yep. Last fall, maybe something like that. But um, excited to talk to you today because we both started notes like right around the same time. I think you started a little bit before I did, but mm -hmm. I know like you were one of the first people that I met in this space, and then. You, you know, since then you've taken it to like a huge level doing all kinds of funds and different things. And so kind of, kind of interested to, you know, to kind of hear about your journey and how you got started. Yeah. And you know, the go big or go home philosophy and Hey, thank you for having me again today. And, you know, I love having conversations with people like you and cause we look back now going on, I don't know, it's probably been six, seven years, probably since the first time we met, uh, mm -hmm. way back in the day, we, uh, were much younger looking back then, um, and stuff, but yeah, one of the things I'll start with is, you know, the space is so interesting because you look at all the people who have come and gone during that time. You know, you look back yeah. at a lot of people who like, you know, somebody actually mentioned somebody's name. Somebody sent me an email yesterday, um, about, and I hadn't heard from this person in four years who yeah, bought a note. They're like, oh, but this investor who the guy's a police officer, I think in California, um, who, you know, you know. Um, oh, I know who you mean. Yeah, yeah. And he's like, yeah, he referenced you. I'm like, wow, what's he doing? He's like, not notes. Um, so, uh, you know, a lot of people do come in and come out of the business, but, um, you know, J Dan, my journeys, I think, you know, very similar with yours where started with one and just, you know, you know, rolled the dice with it and had the confidence to make that first decision, even though, you know, there's no amount of training that you can get to really, you know, understand this business. And I know you're a golfer, um, mm -hmm. you know, I'm a pretty damn good one. You know, the analogy I, I love when people say is, you know, you can watch all the videos in the world about how to hit a golf ball off the tee, but until you get up there and, you know, grab that club and put the ball down on that tee and hit, hit, hit it. That's what note investing is like. It's a completely different animal from that first day that you start. Yeah. I know. Like my first deal, like I learned, so much because yeah it's like people can explain it to you all day long but there's nothing like actually going through the process and just learning the little nuances and the little things that that come up yeah, yeah. and for me i think the biggest uh eye opener i guess was well there's two when i bought my first set of loans because i bought four loans um from a company that I'll name, uh, Automation Finance, um, which I know you're familiar with. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, two were in like bankruptcy, one was not performing, one was performing. But between, I'd say, the servicer and the dealing with the servicer, because I thought there would be a lot more sophistication um, behind some of it. But the other was like, when I started to do due diligence, you know, I wasn't, I was kind of like winging it and like reading a contract, but not really. And then, like the company I was using to do a due diligence, it's like, oh, they create this exceptions report of, we don't see this, we don't see this, we don't see this. Next thing I know, I get like a $1,500 bill. And I'm like, what's this for? Oh, it's $150 for us to list the exception. Then it's like another $100 once the exceptions crossed off the list. And I'm like, well, guess what? Stop what you're doing. I'm going somewhere else. Because I was like, completely mind blown how I felt I was taking advantage of a little bit. Um, you know, when you get, started. well, yeah, $1,500 to do due diligence on a note. That's. And it was a, it was a collateral storage company. Believe it or not. That's really yeah. weird. Well, if anybody wants me to do their due diligence, I'll do it for a thousand all day yeah. long. But, so, yeah. I'll, I'll do it for 1100. So, you know, we'll, yeah. I'll, make it, I'll make you look better, Dan, where I'm at 11, you're 10% lower. Um, there we go. But, yeah. oh yeah. So, you know, and then as, as you know, uh, you know, back in the day, you know, the times have changed so much, you know, contract for deeds. We were all just, you know, so hungry for contract. I mean, it was like, you know, seeing a tape of contract for deeds was like seeing Taylor Swift tickets come across your desk or something. Well, I mean, well it was funny because John Keith was sending those out. Right. And, and what he did, I still don't quite understand why he did it this way. Right. And I don't know if he just had like a dollar threshold for each loan, but like if you made an offer that was acceptable to him, he would take it. And if I came in like a couple hours later with a higher offer, I was out of luck. Yep. So I, I kind of learned that the key was you had to get bids in 
really fast. And, and back then I was newer, I wasn't remotely as fast. Like I didn't have like my systems down for like, okay, here's how I'm going to filter. And here's how we're going to figure this out. And here's how I'm going to calculate my bid. I mean, I had system, but it was just way slower back then. Mm -hmm. And I would sometimes end up like, he'd send them out. Like, I remember there was one time I was down in Denver at this like note local note meetup we used to have. Yeah. And he sent one out and then like, I went home and I stayed up for like four or five hours going through this thing. Cause that was like my shot to get loans. And if I didn't, you know, you might be waiting. You don't know when the next one's coming out. Yep. It was really weird. Yeah. But a fun now, time. Oh, so during that, I used to call myself the midnight, the two investor. Cause I was working my full-time job. You know, I have wife and kids. So I would get those tapes and John's on the West coast. I'm on the East coast and they might come out at, you know, 6 PM or something. And I'd be sitting there chomping a bit, like waiting for my wife and kids to go to bed, you know, and you know, 10 o'clock I'd go down, you know, to my computer and start running those tapes. And exactly what you said, what I would do is I get my bids in at like 1 AM. And even if you were, what was interesting though, to add on to what you're saying, you put the bid in and he would look at it. And let's say I was bidding 15,000. If he needed 17,000, he basically countered to you and say, Hey, 17. So I'm like, okay, yes. You know, so I put in bids and then he countered and I'd be like, okay, I'll take them. Even though someone behind me still may have bid 20, yeah. I'd be 15, but he's like, give it to me at 17. And it's like, okay. So it was completely all about speed, you know, and for people listening who are in the note space, there's, you know, certain sellers who will sell with a due date. And the other is it was called a rolling bid. And he would do a rolling bid of, Hey, whoever got their bid in first would take a look at it and, you know, go for it. So yeah, that was fun times back then. It was crazy times. My big, and it was funny because I was um, pretty new. Mm -hmm. And so I was trying to take a fairly aggressive approach, yep. even though I was new, mm -hmm. um, but I didn't want to get, two bananas. Cause I didn't know what I didn't know. Right. Like, like I didn't want to buy a bunch of these and then find out I made some systematic error yeah. and now I have a big problem, but it's funny. Cause looking back, man, I wish I would have bought all of them. I wish I'd have bought more. They were <laughs> yeah. so cheap, cheap back then. And, and it's funny because like in that, like say 2018 timeframe, yeah. when I was ramping up, everybody was anchored on like 2014 prices when they were even cheaper. So some people were like, Oh, these are expensive now in reality. Like they were dirt oh. cheap. Yeah. So it's, you mentioned like 2018, 2019 for people listening, a contract for deed. And I'm just going to throw some numbers out there. Say a $50,000 balance, non-performing, say $60,000 payoff on call it a $75,000 asset. You were probably paying in the twenties for that asset, maybe 30,000 tops. You know, I would probably say and most of the time you were anywhere between, you know, and that's where, you know, people would teach you that stair step method of, you know, yeah, that was terrible. 000. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, a 50,000, you basically pay 50, 60 cents on the dollar for some of these non-performing assets back then, even lower. Sometimes you get performing in that price range, but you know, you get them for 50, 60 cents where today, that asset's probably trading, you know, at 40,000 plus. So when you look at a percentage basis, it's probably 30 to 40% higher today. And like you said, go back and look at, I went back and look at some of the bids I've made back in the day. And I've got all those old tapes. Yeah, I do yeah. too. Yep. Yeah. So yeah, it's, you know, today you just look back and, and that's the challenge a lot of people have today is they're used to, you know, buying those at such a discount and you could make a good amount of money back in the day on those. And then today, you know, everything has been compressed. So your returns are compressed. And now people are like, I don't want to pay 65 or 70 cents on the dollar today because I bought it for 45 or 50% in the past. And it's like, Oh, that's what the market rate is. That's what the market's saying today. And um, you know, there's still some opportunity out there. There's still some good deals out there, but you know, the analogy that I like to tell people is back then, and I think you'll probably agree, it was like farming. You know, you'd cultivate a relationship and then the crops would just grow and you'd have notes being thrown at you and easy mm -hmm. to buy assets. Today, you're like a hunter with basically holding a, a knife trying to go hunt for food. Like, you know, you don't even have a bow. You got to go out in the woods and try and, you know, kill what you eat. And you're sitting there with a knife trying to 
know, chase after a squirrel or something is really, you know, what it's like today. Yeah, it's definitely a little different. Like I've, I've still been able to find stuff yeah. oh, though. Please. It's just not quite as like, it was nice though to have like a one-stop shop that would just send you everything yeah. you need. I don't quite have that. Yeah. And anymore. that's the challenge today. And I think people got spoiled and you now people forget, you know, we're talking a, you know, industry that's, you know, 15, I mean, 13 to $16 trillion industry. Now, you know, you, me, you know, we're looking to buy, you know, notes here, there, everywhere. We're not buying even a billion dollars. We're not even buying a hundred million dollars. You know, if we're buying a million, you know, depending on, you know, your fund or what's going on, you know, looking at 1 million of 15 trillion, I don't even know what percent of a percent that is, but just such a small component. We're a grain of sand in the sea. So it's so easy for people to find assets, but it's just not a one-stop shop. Did you yeah. That? It's like, you know, I had a uh, Fred and Tracy on a little while back and they were talking about all the seller, just the seller finance research that they did. Right. And there's like 89,000 loans created last year, average balance of 247 K. Yep. And that's just like one year of seller finance loans. And if you look at the number of people that do what we do, mm -hmm. it's just tiny. Yeah. <laughs> like, so there's, there's plenty of stuff out. That's one of the reasons why I still like the space because unlike trying to do other forms of investing, you're not competing with everybody. I, yeah. I like the slowdown because yeah, you get out, you know, excuse the phrase, you get out a lot of riffraff of people, you know, what's great about our space. And I'm curious if you agree, there really aren't, I'll say brokers in the sense of like, or wholesalers, you know, like traditional real estate, anybody mm -hmm. can be a wholesaler in real estate and go out there and find a property on the MLS and then get it under agreement uh, and basically throw it out there and say, oh, I'm a wholesaler or find an off-market property, go wholesale. You know, there's so much of that in real estate where in notes, it's almost impossible because it's such a small space. Everybody knows everybody. And I remember and, and I have people contact me sometimes and they they're like, okay, can you can you like teach me how to be a note broker? Because it's a way to do it potentially without money. Yeah. And I'm like, man, that's tough. Like it's theoretically possible, but it's really, really hard. Like I brokered one a total of one note in my life, and that was just because of the way it worked out. Like that but, I don't even know, remember the details. You know but. how to buy a note. They don't have no clue how to even buy a note or do due diligence on the note. And you know, funny story I'll share is I had a tape once that got put out there and then somebody randomly sent it back to me and it was my tape. And hilarious enough, like we have an email, you know, my, it's not me personally. that sends the tapes out. We have a, you know, mm -hmm. asset sales at 70 investments. I send these things out. Um, but the guy sends it to me and never even realized, like notice the domain. So I'm like, okay, I'm gonna have fun with this guy. So I put some bids in. So I bid my own assets. Um, yeah. So in the, and then I'm asking for the due diligence, this and that. And then the guy's basically taking the email and sending it to sending it back to me, asking for all this information and so forth. And, you know, basically, um, you know, it took a guy about three days before he realized it. And then, um, you know, interestingly enough, um, nobody ever reads an NDA when they sign it. Um, right. I actually, I have language in my NDA that says if you... Um, basically disclose this as a wholesaler or broker. Um, you agree to be penalized $10,000 per asset. Um, and <laughs> this guy signed it and I'm like, you know, and I sent it to him and I'm like, and again, the guy, like you said, has no money, just trying to make an extra buck. But I don't yeah. think people understand the ramifications of that data is so sensitive, you know, that's on there that, you know, the legal liabilities that you could get in trouble for that are so fascinating. And before we recorded, I was talking about, you know, one of the guys we know who took a tape and did a YouTube video and didn't block any information out. And, you know, basically it's not his assets and it's somebody else's. And I'm like, that's just insane. Yeah, it's nuts. Now, I, I once too, I had somebody send me a tape that had some stuff on it that I owned. It wasn't like a tape that I put out, but I had a couple assets that I owned. I, I didn't take it to your level though. And try yeah. to bid on them. I thought about it and I'm like, nah, I got other things to do. I'm gonna no, do that's that right my now. Cynical side of I just want to screw with this person. Um, yeah. You know, and I what, the other thing too is I bid like a ridiculous number. So um, to him. Oh, so they get excited and they they get excited go, because yeah. they, their number to me um, 
was like, you know, they had like thirty thousand dollars for themselves in this deal. Um, you know, they, so I, I bid them high unintentionally because um, I think they. Well, no, what they first asked is, "Hey, do you have strike prices for these?" And I'm like, "Oh yeah, here you go." Um, you know, and you set that, them really low. Yeah, I set them <laughs> low and I bid really high. Um, so a person was like licking their chops trying to you know close the deal and so forth. And um, but as you know, on me being the the cynical side, was asking them, like, you know, oh, who's the seller? Can I get the servicing comments? Can I get this? Can I get that? And just asking them like a million questions. Then I started making up questions that actually weren't even like note investing related um, because these people had no clue like who a servicer even was. So I'm like, uh -huh. oh, this is, you know, deep down, I'm like, I'm just having way too much fun with these people. That's funny. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've never taken it to quite that degree. I know the other one you've liked to do in the past is when someone wants you to, uh, to bid based on payoff, you ask them for like all the receipts and documentation yeah. on the payoff well, amount. Yeah, I mean, in the in, you know, they'll come back and say, uh, no, or we don't have it. I'm like, well, how do you guarantee? What if they contest this bill? Like, how do I, you know, how do I defend that when it's coming from four servicers ago? Like, you know, prove to me that you paid the tax. I mean, deferred. In, I mean, default interest. That's easy. That's every servicing software. But mm -hmm. some of these where it's got thirty thousand dollars in legal fees, for example, in Georgia. You know, I found out the other day that you're only allowed to collect um, up to 15% of the uh, payoff in legal fees. So we have a loan where the hmm. borrower contested it. And, you know, so we're you now it's a hundred rough numbers, hundred thousand dollar loan. And we are right now at about $11,000 in legal fees um, on this loan, believe it or not in Georgia, um, which is a fast foreclosure state. But again, he filed, a you know, lots of stuff going on. Okay. I've had that before, like where they file bankruptcy and then that drags out and then you get it dismissed and then they fight yeah. the foreclosure and That's, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, they're, they're contesting it, but we're at like 11,000. Our attorney's like, Hey, just an FYI, you know, did you, I know if you knew this in Georgia, but here's, um, you know, here, you know, just, it, you're going to be capped out pretty soon. I'm like, Oh, I didn't know that. You know, good to know. The other interesting fact about Georgia, while I was talking Georgia Mm -hmm. Second position loan, the usury interest rate is 60% as in six zero. So you can charge up to 60%. There's a guy I know who he's also put some stuff on paper stack who literally charges like 35 to 55% on loans. And I'm like, if anybody is getting a loan at that interest rate, they must be so desperate or dire that they're probably not going to be able to perform. <laughs> That's funny. This is good information for me because I'm in the midst of getting the license in okay. Georgia. So, although yeah. that's a whole process like in and of itself, just uh, getting them to tell you what they need. <laughs> yeah. Um, and it's interesting because I've got licensed in Georgia and, you know, you submit all the information and then it like sits for two months and then they come back and forth. And um, the other interesting one that I just had a conversation with was California. So I have a debt buyer's license in California mm -hmm. and they randomly out of blue, like, Hey, we saw your annual report. We want to get on a call with you. And I'm like, sure. Um, and you're like, well, we noticed you say you're a debt buyer. Um, but on the form it asks, like, are you, you know, do you do first per first, like first person collections or third first party collections or third party collections? First party meaning, do I collect on my own assets? Third party meaning, mm -hmm. do I- As a servicer. And, yeah, as yeah, a servicer. somebody else, yeah. And I put no for both. And I also put zero for like assets and stuff because you know, I didn't have you know no, no loans or anything in California. So they call me and they're like, yeah, can you tell me a little bit about your business? I'm like, yeah, we buy defaulted debt, but we don't service it. We have a third party servicer. And I, you know, and I, that's why I filled this out on a form. And they're like, oh, you don't have any loans? And I'm like, I don't have any loans in California. Um, I've got loans in other states and we kind of do a lot of work mostly in, you know, these coasts, but I know getting licenses in other states can take considerable amount of time. And if I have the opportunity to, I didn't want to be held up by waiting for a license and clicks an opportunity came. And actually, I'll be honest with you, your fees are actually not, ex not as expensive as I thought to get the California license. Cause everyone always thinks California mm -hmm. is 
ungodly expensive, which typically is, um, you know, it's 800 bucks for an LLC, but I think the licensing was only like $150 in California. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. So it was like, and I don't think I needed a bond or, you know, a lot of the information. So I'm like, oh, wow, this actually isn't that bad. The one that's, you know, the one that's the biggest pain. Um, and mm -hmm. I know you, I think you've had some experience in this state because I, you know, buy a lot of loans in this state. Which about Pennsylvania? Yep. <laughs> I've done one loan in Pennsylvania. I will never do another. Yeah. So Pennsylvania, yeah. interestingly enough, they have a lender license and a servicer license. You know, um, but technically, um, I fall under the servicer license because that, it's yeah. so backwards. It's I didn't know they required a lender license. It's really interesting because um, it's a long story, but there was this, you know, Lawsuit uh, between the attorney general and Harbor Portfolio. Oh yeah, where the CFDs and the other and, user and I bought rate. yeah I bought one of those CFDs like before the whole lawsuit right. Yep. So the Pennsylvania attorney general called me and wanted me to change the terms of the loan and convert it from a land contract to a mortgage, which I was like, mm -hmm. okay, cool, fine. Mm -hmm. Of course, the borrower is being uncooperative. I'm like, I'm trying to give you a credit and put you and, and then it was a whole thing. So I got to know the attorney general, like entirely too much, but it's interesting. She never said anything about a lender license yeah, and so, the whole thing. Yeah. So they have a lender, but a lender is typically if you're originating, if you're buying the, paper, oh, okay. If, if you're buying paper, then they want you to get a servicer license, even though you don't service it that you have to, um, because you have the right to service it and you gave up that right, they want you to get a license. And hmm. then the other one that blows my mind all the time too is Ohio, because Ohio, I'm like, okay, I buy paper, but I don't service it. And like, well, you need the servicer arm. So now you need to have an MLO and be an MLO. And then like, now you need this. To buy a loan? Yeah. Yeah. And I'm like, thankfully I am an MLO. Um, cause I got it way back in the day just to, um, have, because I know, um, if I, you know, I'm in Virginia and basically I looked at one point in time, like, okay, Virginia is a pretty lax state for things. And if I wanted to originate like, you know, some loans or if, you know, even like some private money loans and stuff, it's just, yeah, yeah. I understand the process. So it's, it's funny. It. So, so I just recently completed the 20 hour course. Yeah, to get licensed, and I don't, I don't, I haven't gotten the license yet. Um, for kind of the same reason, right? Like, like I just yeah. wanted to have some flexibility to do other mm -hmm. kinds of loans and yeah. and learn more about the business. You know, the the twenty hour training is I don't know. I found it. I don't want to use the term comical, but some of the stuff on there is just like. The, well, well, the whole like ethics and fraud part yes, the ethics is thing, like, yeah. hilarious. They're like, you, it, I, I don't remember exactly how it went. Cause I, I was just like, not even paying attention and the questions were easy, yeah. but it's like basically saying, yeah, if you say one thing and then put something else in the paperwork, that's bad. You shouldn't do that. I'm like, yeah. like no well, kidding. Like, <laughs> like choice. Okay. the borrower fills applic application that says they make $5,000 a month. Their pay stubs say they make three thousand dollars a month. Do you a put down ten thousand dollars because it matches the amount that they need to afford the home? B don't question anything and just assume the five thousand is correct. Or C ask them why there's a delta between the five thousand and the three thousand. Like you know, like yeah, hmm, it's kind of silly. Big. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. So. Yeah. And when you, it's interesting though, because you have such background on note investing, when you mm -hmm. go to take the exam, uh, you're going to basically like fly through it because it's. Well, well the, the, the sections like the training course section on like foreclosure and bankruptcy were hilarious. Yeah. Cause I'm like, Oh, <laughs> I where, already know this part. Where they get you is on some of them is like, is this a, Hila XYZ or RESPA ABC. And like, you know, it's like, oh man, is that RESPA or Tila? Like the know, one that I liked was closures. like on the 1003 form, how many pages are there in the additional borrower form? Like, who cares? It's a yeah. <laughs> piece of paperwork. You can change it. Well, well, the other thing too is like, you're right. Like, okay, let me just go look at the 1003. Like it's a form that, you know, 
you know, that, you know, some of those questions when they ask like that of like, which, re you know, is it RESPA section 123 or 147 B? And it's like, guess what? I can go open RESPA and just Google it and figure out which one. But I know the crux behind it is like, you know, oh, you can't charge, you know, additional fees for this, you know, or, or whatever right. it can be. Yeah, there's a lot of just common sense stuff. Exactly. But in there, but yeah, just, a lot of the licensing isn't expensive and it just seems like it can give you some flexibility. Yeah, it but. does. Um, where it gets expensive, honestly, is the damn bonds. You know, mm -hmm. that's, I mean, to get the license usually isn't hard. It's now you got to go get a, a, an insurance bond essentially to, um, you know, which, you know, cost you, you know, a few thousand bucks here and there and stuff. So that's where it can get. Yeah, pricey, but Pennsylvania to get their license. Oh my God. The amount of paperwork was just, oh, I mean, and then, so I have my company and, you know, it's got me and I've got people who, you know, have titles of director. So now because they had director titles, they had to get put in the system, even though they have nothing over originating or even looking at the loans, you know, like, um, you know, my, someone in my sales team, like had to go get the FBI background and get put into the M in the NMLS, you know, because they held the title of director just because to get now the background check. And I'm like, Oh my God, like seriously. Yeah. I, I, I'll not deal with that state yeah. anymore. Oh. I'll just, I'll just pass on that one. Yeah. So oh. what's your, uh, what is your favorite state and what's your least favorite state? You know, my favorite state is, well, it's probably Tennessee. Just because I've had some really good experiences there on a couple of deals and the foreclosure was really fast, mm -hmm. but I haven't done much there. Um, I was about to say Michigan, just because I've done so many there and I've had a lot of mm -hmm. good success, even though, um, you know, it's got like the redemption period and, and some other stuff that's not always great. And it's, <laughs> it's cold. So you got to make sure pipes don't freeze. Yep at different times. Um, well, least favorite was definitely Pennsylvania because of that one experience. Mm -hmm. Um, beyond that, it's hard to say it might be Mississippi now. Thank like, you. like a lot of my experiences are based on like one or two mm -hmm. deals. Like I've had a handful there, but the ones I've done in like Jackson, I've ended up foreclosing on. Mm -hmm. And then occasionally like had some problems and things. In fact, um, I remember you week, had one that had like the trash out or something that was just a complete, was that one in Jackson or where was no, that no. So the, the hoarder house, the hoarder house was in Muncie, Indiana. Okay. And, and yeah. Muncie is my least favorite city. So I've done two in Muncie and I swear to God, like every vendor contractor realtor, I went through like every realtor in town. Mm -hmm. They were all awful. And if someone from Muncie is listening to this, like, I'm really sorry you're from Muncie. Like, it was a terrible place. Like, um, but what happened was, so I did a foreclosure, got it back. And it was weird. Through the whole process, I could not um, make contact with the borrower, right? Finally get through the process. We get in the property and it's literally waist deep trash throughout. And this is like an 1800 square foot house. Mm -hmm. I, had, I ended up needing like four 40 yard four 40 yard dumpsters and they were completely full of stuff. And what was really, and then like I was getting trash out quotes of like $10,000, $12,000. I'm like, I'm not doing that. What I ended up doing was just running the dumpsters myself. Mm -hmm. And I found a crew of guys from Indianapolis off of Craigslist Yeah, that did an awesome job. Like they kicked, but I forget what it cost me, but it wasn't $10,000. Um, got it cleaned out. What was weird was when they started, the borrower like showed up and said, Hey, what are you doing? I've got stuff in there. Like, I don't know if he just like jumped out of the bushes yeah, or, or what it was really mm -hmm. weird. And then he like ran away and that was the only contact we ever had with the borrower, okay. but the place was, uh, it, it was repugnant. I actually visited the property, but not until it was cleaned out, but it was pretty nasty. And you know, the bones of the house were okay. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And basically I tried to sell it and for the most I could sell it for, I was going to take a $20,000 loss, mm -hmm. which I didn't want to do. My only saving grace on this whole deal was uh, I didn't use outside funding. I used my money. 
Okay. It would have um, been worse if I was using somebody yeah. else's money, right? But I'm like, but the bones of the house were okay. And it looked like I could kind of rehab my way out of it. Mm -hmm. So I try to rehab my way out of it and like do some painting, do some this and that. And that was where it turned into like the money pit. People did bad jobs or like, oh, there's this, oh, there's that and round and round. And, and that went on for a long time. Finally got it like kind of sort of rehabbed, got it sold. And I lost $19,000. So like I went through a lot of heartache and, and I saved yeah. myself another thousand. But basically it, everyone I dealt with in that town just was, it, it was tough. It, it was yeah, not so, easy. Yeah, I had similar in Fort Wayne um, where it was just the inspectors always, you know, oh, you know, we took it back and like, oh, you're cracked light fixture on the outside of the property. Then I have a realtor listed for sale who puts a lockbox and just gives somebody the lockbox combination and doesn't even go and visit. The next thing I know, all the appliances are stolen and half the coppers ripped out of the place. And basically like the agents, like, I don't know what happened. And it's like, you know, you, I, I, I had, an, I had an attempted copper theft in Fort Wayne one time. Yeah. It was really weird. The property was vacant. They like smashed the one wall in the bathroom yeah. and like tried to get some copper and I guess failed and gave up super yeah. weird. Yeah. Um, so I've like clean out stories I just use and I'll pay a little extra now with some of the preservation companies, which sometimes I feel like being gouged because I've hired, tried to hire people on Craigslist in the past. And mm -hmm. like one time they showed me the clean out and basically, so, you know, they gave me a price. They got a dumpster, but it was more than one dumpster load. So they took the first dumpster of stuff and they took whatever is left over and just crack, threw it all in the basement. So they showed pictures of the upstairs, which looked, Oh, it's all, cleaned out and stuff and then you now i send the agent through oh it's all cleaned out and they're like i can't even get in the basement there's so much trash down here i was oh, like I, oh i i had one not quite like that in uh, lima ohio mm -hmm. so the contractor got a dumpster and they were doing this trash out and they filled the dumpster and i can't remember the details of how this went down but they like didn't pay the bill for the dumpster or something yeah and so they came out and just dumped all the trash in the yard, yard. kind of like on the Sopranos really yep. done. It was kind of like mm -hmm. that. So then I had to pay to have somebody else come out mm -hmm. and clean it up. So that yeah. was awesome. But, uh, but I think because you, you have a hard stop in a couple minutes here. Yeah. So yeah, we can wrap up, but I was just going to mention my favorite or least favorite state. And I joke that is, is Ohio. You know, I always say only headaches in Ohio, um, mm -hmm. you know, New York, of course, nobody likes, but for me, it seems like every time I have a borrower that just pulls some type of stunt that is just disbelievable, like, I can't believe somebody's actually going to attempt this. It always seems to be in Ohio. You know, it's weird. A lot of people don't like that. Say, and I've had some challenge, you know, I've had some deals that, that were challenging there, but mm -hmm. overall, I've done okay in Ohio, like, knock on wood. We just haven't gotten bit, but. Yeah. My, my favorite story in Ohio is when my dead borrower showed up to court, so. Um, that's impressive. Know. They, I, I know, you know, <laughs> and well, where was it on the news lately where a woman took like her uncle to close out a bank account and he was dead and basically was like trying to say, have you seen that? No, like, I haven't I seen in, that. I think it was in South America or something where like, I think she actually killed him, but who knows, but she literally like wheels him into like, it was literally weekend at Bernie's, you know, and she basically was like, <laughs> oh, wow. Like she brought in, the she brought in literally the dead body and basically was like, oh, he's, he's tired or sleepy. So I'll just say. I'll grab his hand and help him sign. Like literally there's like, and she kids. murdered him. And then I think they think like she, uh, you know, basically killed him first, like gave him some pills or drugged him or something, but then brought him in. Yeah. Google it. It's freaking crazy. I'll have to look that one up. That's interesting. But if I find the story, maybe I'll link it. In so, the yeah. I had a, notes. a contract for deed and this, this one's just mind blowing contract for deed or passed away. The son shows up in court because the son has the same name. He was mm -hmm. a junior. And it's like, so crazy thing. My attorney didn't even pick up on it. They're like, oh yeah, I could continue for an additional 30 days because the borrower appeared. I'm like, the borrower's dead. And they're like, oh, because you know, people don't realize when you hire an attorney, they don't actually go. They hire like another attorney to go on their behalf. And it's all like this little network. 90% of the time, they don't even open the file or read. I've had one where the attorney's like, oh, this is a contract for deed. Um, but then, so they file probate and we're trying to get it put. So basically the trying to get it put in 
like the kids' names or whatnot. So the mother, um, but they weren't married, is on with the probate attorney and stuff and asks the question like she's like, Well, I'm the I'm the father, I'm the I'm the mother of all his kids. And they're like, Okay, and like, what are the kids' names? And then she paused because she couldn't figure out what the kids' names were, you know, because she had I, she had multiple kids with different partners, but we're sitting here and I'm like, it's the most embarrassing thing. <laughs> I'm sitting here like, Oh my God. Um, but the probate attorney, and this is on zoom is kind of like almost losing it laughing. Like, um, any names, like, can you name one? She's like, can I get back to you? And well, she's like on her kids names. Yeah. On her kids name. <laughs> like, sure. Um, but yeah. And I'm not, you know, mentioning that to like, you know, sound cynical or, you know, basically, you know, use it as a joke in, in any way, shape or form, but it's just some of the crazy, I'm just using it as a crazy story of, you know, Mine, Bob, yeah, you know, real quick. That. Like I was on a zoom call on a zoom court hearing over COVID yeah, and the borrower was just spewing all kinds of nonsense. And then at the end, she's like, I have an attorney and the judge is like, okay, who's your attorney? And she says this name and it sounds like she's winging it out. And then she's like, well, I can't find him on the bar. And, and they're spelling it to each other back and forth. And then mm -hmm. the judge finds it. She's like, oh, it's actually like one letter off. It's spelled like this. Borrower's like, that's what I said. And then the judge is like, no, you did. Judge gets mad. Mm -hmm. And then the judge sets a date and she's like, okay, we're going to do this again, like on this date. And you need to be here in person with this attorney. And the borrower goes on my birthday and gets all upset. And I had to turn my camera off because I couldn't keep a straight face. My lawyer was, my attorney was super impressive. Yeah. I, I talked to him afterwards. I'm like, how do you keep a straight face with some of this stuff? It's just so absurd oh. sometimes. Oh, it, it is. And I actually had that same thing happen in, in court. I actually, here's another one. And I know we got to you know, wrap this up. Yeah. I had a case where the borrower defaulted in bankruptcy and we were trying to get a motion for relief. And it got delayed because the borrower's bankruptcy attorney was also in bankruptcy and was collecting the, you know, they have to pay an upfront fee to the attorney to file a case, was taking the fees and basically misappropriating them and got disbarred because that attorney basically went after a judge and claimed like, you know, and basically said the judge was, you know, basically doing illegal stuff and like, you know, or what, and literally like my attorney's like, man, like, and then like he sent me the link to, you know, her hearing um that she had in regards to like oh here's the hearing that like she ended up getting disbarred at and he's like you want some entertainment just watch this and literally she's up there like she never did anything wrong and saying like every attorney and accusing everyone on the panel that you know it's like you know three or four you know people who basically figure it out or whatever you know um she's going after them you know as well and i'm like oh my god this is just like you know must see tv it's a matter of time until someone does like a note investing reality show. Yep. There's money to be made for someone there. Well, that's, you know, when my podcast originally started, that's what it really was about. With Gail and I driving home from work, I was like, we got to start recording this stuff because these stories are just way too good. Yeah, for sure. So, well, Chris, man, thanks again for joining. I really appreciate it. Yep. Welcome here anytime. So, yeah, Dan, thank you. And I'll have you back on my show uh, in the near future as well. All right. Sounds great. Great. Thanks, thanks. Dan.